Hello, and welcome back to another one-on-one -on -one interview. I am Max Spitza, joined by my colleague, Lauren Monderulli, and we have a very special guest with us today, Mr. Paul Hembo Hemakitis, currently an, a personality and content producer at ESPN. I mean, so many things you're on that I, I don't even think it's worth listing all of them, but we're really glad you're here today. How are you doing today? I'm doing outstandingly well. I appreciate the... Uh... The introduction and uh it's gonna be awesome today to get a chance to talk to you guys a little bit about uh our new book project and anything else going on in the world of sports or my career that you might find interesting so it's a pleasure to be on with you uh looking forward to diving in and most impressively uh you nailing my last name pronunciation which is very rare so uh a job all done this uh the interview is off to a rip-roaring start oh yeah so a lot of practice went into that as well <laughs> i had to ask a lot of my roommates a lot of i was like hey like Guys, I'm from Arizona. I don't see names like this very often. I was like, I need to ask ahead of time. So I did I did a little bit of research. If you aren't from Athens, you're probably not going to have a good chance of getting my last name right. So I'm glad that you did your, uh, did your homework. <laughs> so, I mean, just getting started. I mean, new book, got your answers. The 100 Greatest Sports Arguments Settled. Do you want to tell, tell us a little bit? I mean, I already already ordered the book. I'm excited for it to come in. What what's your are you excited? Are you are you very happy you could finally release this into the world? Sure, of course. I'll uh I'll give you the um the elevator pitch. So uh Greeny and I uh wrote a book uh two years ago and it was released in April, um, entitled Got Your Number. It's a hundred chapters, and what we did was identify an athlete in most cases, a coach, a team, a horse that is most associated with free number. one through 100. And that was, I would say, largely a sports history book. Um, that's kind of my first love. Um, book sort of majors in sort of intensive uh, sports research and more than anything is a means of, of storytelling, like, you know, amplifying the careers of so many legends across sports. And people really liked it. But what we learned was that the one itch that we didn't really scratch was the idea of sports debate. And that's what we wanted to major in in our second book, Got Your Answers, which you just uh, laid out for us. What we effectively do is we've identified the 100 most spirited debates in sports, and we answer all of them. In most cases, it's a top 10 list. In some cases, it's 5 or 15 or 20. But by and large, it's a book with 100 lists, and it's a book that answers some of the most important questions, some of the most heated questions. some of the most controversial questions in all of sports. It's largely built around the data behind a lot of things. So, for example, you might ask yourself, you know, who are the greatest players in the history of the men's NCAA tournament? And I spent an awful lot of time researching that. What we did was spit out the first, second, and third team all time. And we do that 99 more times. And so that's sort of the, the elevator pitch is that we answer – sports 100 greatest questions we do it objectively but there's also plenty of you know opinion based more emotional or subjective things too but that's part of the beauty of being a sports fan we love debating these things we love arguing about these things that's kind of what we do that's kind of what we're, we're best at so imagine you know you're with your uh with your roommates you're at their barber shop you're watching games with your family and it's out of hand the kind of things that you talk about the kinds of things that you would argue about that's what we address in this book and we do it 100 times Sounds awesome. You've mentioned that this book is debate styled. How did these debates translate between you and Greenberg to on paper, like from out loud to the book? So I started off with like, I don't know, maybe somewhere between 150 and 200 options for us to consider. And what we wound up doing was you know, paring the list down to 100. And then once we chose the 100 questions that we wanted to answer, that's when I sort of went into the lab and researched everything and spat out like a list of we'll say in most cases, 15 to 20. So for example, I'm looking at chapter 11 in our book. It's entitled, uh, what are the top 10 legacy positions in major sports history? Okay, so that was one of the 100 that we chose. And so what I did is I researched the positions across sports history that had the most legendary players and probably put together a list of, I don't know, 15 or 20. So think about great left fielders that the Red Sox have had, linebackers that the Bears have had, defensive linemen that the Rams have had, center fielders that the Yankees have had, et cetera. And so <clears throat> once I got to a place where I was confident that we weren't missing anybody, that's when Greedy and I basically did 100 debates amongst ourselves. 
how should we choose the 10? And then how should we rank the 10? And we did that over the course of several months, candidly. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, for a book that's, you know, this small, we're, we're talking about, you know, lists and two to 300 word capsules. It's a fairly abbreviated way of doing it. There was so much of that debate that had to hit the cutting room floor. The beauty of the lists, though, is that the, the lists are the embodiment, the manifestation of all of these sports debates. And that's kind of how we did it. So it went from being who might we consider, how are we going to rank them? And there's a lot of debate that went on between he and I in terms of making sure that we get the most accurate top 10 lists in most cases cases um, that we wound up with. So is there any argument if you want to disclose it? I know it's coming out and you want people to be reading and, and experiencing it for the first ha- first time when reading it. But is there any argument that you think is your favorite that you maybe it took the longest or you and Greeny were just going at it for for days trying to trying to really nail down that list? Is there anyone that you like the most and that you're most proud of? Um one that look, there's plenty of debate that that went on from from any number of these most definitely nothing contentious but you know not all sports fans are going to see eye to eye and that's kind of the beauty of this stuff one of my favorite things that we did in chapters 34 and 35 i'm looking at that, that in my book right now is what is the perfect all-time baseball lineup according to me and then what is the all-time perfect baseball lineup according to greeny those are chapters 34 and 35 so what he and i both did independently in this case was write down who we think the best players are in the history of baseball at their respective positions. And what was bizarre is that there is very, very little overlap between his starting lineup and my starting lineup. It could be a function of the stats that we value. It could be a function of our age. It could be a function of any number of things, our exposure to certain players, or, again, any number of things that could make a difference. But that's a unique one because, in most cases, the lists are... A, a compilation or rather um, a putting together conversations that he and I had and blending them to form these lists. Well, in that particular case, it's here's what I think and here's what you think. And that's what makes those two chapters, I think, very different, different, but also very fun, because no matter where you are on the pendulum, he, he and I both make independent arguments. And there aren't that many opportunities for us to do that throughout the book. Most of them are sort of collaborative efforts, you might say. You've done a lot during your sports media career, as like Max was kind of getting into before, producing, co-hosting, and now like on to writing. Can you explain those transitions in that process and kind of what like was going through your mind during all of this? Of course. So um, when I was in school, um, getting a communications degree as my undergrad, and then I went to LaSalle to get a master's degree in education because I thought I wanted to work in sort of that avenue or area. Of sports and then ESPN just kind of came calling it just sort of by chance having met a recruiter having interviewed for jobs I just sort of excuse me sort of got in the door um, and just kind of took the opportunities that have come and and ran with it originally I started at ESPN exclusively as a behind the scenes sort of entry level researcher and that's when I you might say like really became a sports expert like when I got to ESPN I knew more about sports than all my friends, but I certainly didn't know more about sports than everyone that worked at ESPN. But I spent many, many years refining my skills, gaining more knowledge, learning how to answer the any question that any person on TV or the radio could possibly have. And over the course of many, many years doing that, this is my 10th year at ESPN now, I became an expert in the content, as you might expect. And that opened up opportunities to go from researching TV to producing it open up opportunities to actually be on the air, whether it be on podcasts or, or whether it be on the radio where I am now. And it naturally, the reason that I'm here, of course, is that it opened up opportunities to write and to write books with Greeny um, and major really in sports history and sports research and sports debate, which are the things that I, you know, was, you know, in the minds doing for my first five, six, seven years at ESPN uh, beneath the surface. And now it's finally starting to pop out and manifest. So it's been a pretty wild journey. I would have never imagined I'd be the kind of person whose name would be on the uh, the, the title of a book and um, on the New York Times bestselling author list or the co-host of a national radio show or any of those things. I guess what I would tell young people is become an expert in something. Know what you're good at and chase it down ruthlessly and, and relentlessly because it's such a competitive field um, that if you're not able to separate yourself, it's very easy to get lost. In my world, it was let's be as good as you can be at research, at digging up the numbers at allowing numbers to sing. And once those stats sort of become embedded into my brain and I can speak them fluently to our audience, 
that sets me apart, I think, from from most people doing what I do. So that was my lane, and I'm running down that lane as fast as I possibly can. And you you started to touch on it a little bit. I mean, for all the kids out there that want to be the next Paul Hembo, what do you? What are three tips you have for them, especially in this growing age of podcasts and and blogging and and all that that's grown substantially, definitely since you started and like, what are your three tips for kids that want to just get into the business, but not only get in the business, but be successful in the business? Sure. So my first tip would be dream bigger than me. You can definitely do better, better than me. There's no question about it. Like when I, if you had told me that I'd be doing any of this 10 years ago, I would have said, that's beyond my wildest dreams. And now I'm still chasing it. You need to always move the goalpost, no matter what you think would be your ultimate, your pinnacle, your zenith, you can go farther than that. Um, the world is full of opportunity. And so the first thing I would say is, Never sell yourself short. Be relentless in whatever you're pursuing and do it faster and harder and more vigorously than anyone else. Although that's generic feedback, it's the kind of thing that I've done that has worked for me because when you set yourself apart in that way, your peers notice. And that obviously is super important. Um, I mentioned it's important to find your specialty. That doesn't mean you have to have some sort of secret niche or anything along those lines. But it is to say that if you try to be someone that you're not, if you try to emulate someone, there's a good chance that you'll fall short because you might be um, aiming at a target that isn't attainable. For me, I knew I was a really good researcher, and I knew that with that information, I could make something uh, of it in a more prominent, forward-facing, public-facing role. And that's what I've done, because I know I'm better at this one thing than most people. And so what I've done is become an expert in one thing, and then I've amplified that skill over and over and over and over again. And I guess the last thing that I would share, or the last thing that I would recommend is, it's really important to have not just advocates uh, and supporters in your corner, but influential ones. Uh, I can say confidently that there's a 0% chance that I'd be chatting with you today if it were not for my years-long relationship with Mike Greenberg, who has been um, a mentor of mine now for almost 10 years. And candidly, I would say my the greatest I have learned from him has way less to do with any personal conversations he and I have had and way more to do with the... Uh, learning through osmosis, just being in his orbit every single day for nearly 10 years. When you constantly surround yourself uh, with greatness, when you are exposed to people who do the thing that you want to do, that's the best way to get better. Um, Always challenge yourself to be greater than you can be. And a great way to do that is to surround yourself by people who are doing it really well. That doesn't mean I believe I'm going to be the next greenie someday, because that's not what I'm going to be, nor... um, what I should be. I have my own lane that I'm in, and that's the lane I'm trying to occupy. Um, just like he's done, like he's doing what he does as well as anyone. That's sort of the path that I like to ch- um, go down myself, although it would be, of course, in a different lane. I would say, though, in his case in particular, I was surrounded by him every single day and remain so. That in and of itself has made me better. And of course, his advocacy has gone, gone a long way in, in providing me opportunities in my career that I would obviously never have had otherwise. So kind of going off of that, you said your specialty is research. I'm assuming that's a lot of numbers and stats based off the work I've seen you do as of lately. And with Greenberg, he's really big on opinions and everything. How do you lean more into your opinionated side regarding sports and gain that confidence in that side of the skill as well? It's a great question because for the longest time, I was only comfortable, you might say, communicating facts, things that I know. This player is averaging 8.3 yards per pass attempt over his last 10 games. That's fourth in the NFL over that span. Now, what I just said was true, but it's not that meaningful. It's not that fluent to the audience. That same piece of information needs to contextualize and amplified through observation and through opinion in order for it to be as good as possible. So, for example, instead of such and such quarterback is averaging 8.3 yards per pass attempt over his last 10 games, that ranks fourth in the NFL over that span. Well, what did he look like the 10 games before that? Is that an improvement or is that regression? Oh, it's improvement. Okay. Well, why is he improving? Well, he's throwing the ball outside the numbers with a lot more frequency. He's trusting his arm strength to get the ball downfield and give his receivers one-on-one opportunities to create yards downfield. So that's why it's happening. What does it mean? Well, the next team that they play, the such-and-such team, is below average at defending the pass outside the numbers. So there's a real opportunity here for this quarterback to be able to take advantage of that weakness and amplify one of his own strengths. And that's the reason why I'm going to win the game, but they're going to cover the point spread. 
See what I just did there? I took a, a, a very basic fact that most anyone that knows how to use the internet could find, and I turned it into a piece of storytelling. And if you do that over and over and over again, your opinions will be extremely informed, and the audience will learn to trust what you say because they know that what you're providing them is, is opinion through rigor, through observation, through study, through research. And that's a much better way to present a set of facts than it is to either just say the fact or to sort of aimlessly express an opinion based on anecdotal uh, observation or something to that effect. And I mean, I definitely think your history playing baseball, your life has definitely also affected that because like, especially now baseball is such an analytical sport. Oh yeah. But I mean, I used to play baseball as we both know, there's definitely a lot more to sports than just the analytics. So, I mean, do you think that analytics has been a good, I, obviously it's a great thing for sports and it's definitely improved sports, but do you think it's taken away from that different aspect of like, yeah, this guy is great analytically, but is he a good guy in the, in, in the, in the locker room? You know, does he, does he bunt when he needs to, does it like, do you think that is kind of going away with analytics or do you think it's still going to be there as, as long as, as so, long as the sport is? So analytics aren't going anywhere. So my opinion of whether or not they are good or bad for the sport or for sports is completely meaningless. I think the better way to answer your question, which is a good one, is it is merely a tool and analytics can be as useful as you allow them to be and can be as restrictive as you might allow them to be. What you don't want to be is the get off my lawn sort of traditionalist type who is it willing to entertain the possibility that this information could be valuable. You also don't want to live in a world in which former players or former coaches or film junkies or people that don't live in the world of numbers don't have any use or value. And that's probably sort of where I try to find myself. I like to like sort of surround myself, you might say, with all of the evidence. So these are the numbers that I like to look up. These are the opinions that I choose to value. This is the, the these are the things when I watch football games or whatever sport I'm watching that I choose to value. Let's, let's blend all these things th together in the stew and create or concoct a good opinion out of that. Now, I'm always going to start with the numbers, but that doesn't mean that if a if baseball reference tells me a player is worth 5.3 war, that I'm going to immediately assume that he is better than someone with 4.9. Because um, look, you play baseball just like I did. You know that there's a lot more nuance to that stat in particular, and that stats are much more useful over a durable period of time. And pointing to one single number over a relatively small sample size would do the audience an injustice if you are choosing to use that as whatever comes after the equal sign. To me, it is a tool that should be before the equal sign. And what comes after the equal sign should be the answer or an opinion to a variety of different factors that are sort of in that stew. And if you don't think that way, if you don't think critically, well, that's when you're going to wind up being wrong about all sorts of stuff. And that's going to be when you wind up sort of chasing your tail, because candidly, that's the way that most of the world reacts and sees things, because we're all so um, subjected to our own biases. And that's why if you can create sort of a, a critical thinking stream of consciousness for yourself and you repeat it time and time again, that's going to enable you to find your your strong opinions. And those opinions, more often than not, will then be right. So just getting back to the book, how would you compare your honor work with Greenberg to the book? Like, is it the spirit similar? Is the banter? Just so readers know what to expect when they're reading to the first page and going on. Yeah. I mean, the the stuff in the book is very like sports talk radio. It's very much so. Like, I'm going to just I'm going to open to a random page right now. Read the question aloud and prove it. Who are the top 10 defenders in NBA history? So if you're someone that knows and loves basketball, you could spend the next five hours with your friends debating whether or not Tim Duncan was a better defender than Dikembe Mutombo, who we both have in the top five. That is just an example of any number of hundreds, if not thousands of questions that will arise from these conclusions that we draw. Uh, I just pulled up another one. What are the top 15 most hilarious names in baseball from the 19th century? There's some lighthearted stuff there, too. The, the point is, it's very much like what you hear on the radio, but it's also very much like what you hear in your brain on your daily in your daily life. If you're the, any kind of sports fan like I am, these are the kinds of debates. These are the kinds of questions. Um, these are the kinds of things that you have thought about because we love caring about things that are so frivolous and meaningless. But that's part of the beauty, the part of the charm, part of the nature of sports that we just love so much. 
is that you can actually spend an hour debating whether or not Tim Duncan was a better rim protector than Hakeem Olajuwon, and you can both be right. Um, we obviously have to rank one ahead of the other, but that's the whole point. The whole point is when you're, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a quiet moment and a sports debate in your mind or you're with a friend or you're watching a game and something like that comes up, well, this can sort of be your, this can sort of be your handbook. Green and I have spent thousands of hours researching the answer to these questions. And in this $15 book, like we're going to provide those answers succinctly. And what I can assure you is that they're incredibly well-researched. Um, a lot of them are super serious, like, you know, who are the best defenders? And other ones are kind of frivolous, like, oh, these are some hilarious baseball names. That's kind of the point, though. The, the idea that it's lighthearted, it's easy to read, it's easy to flip through, you could easily pick it up and put it down. And I think what you'll find is that you can hear him speaking in the words that he writes, and you can hear us debating in the list that we conceive. Now, I want to thank you one more time for joining us today. I want to respect your time and make sure you can get to probably hundreds of of things you have today because this is a great book. I'm very excited for it to come in. Very excited. I mean, I was just talking about it with eight people I ran in today. I was like, hey, I'm going to have some information. I'm going to have some statistics to back it up. And you guys aren't going to be able to show me wrong because I have two geniuses who prove it. So uh, I want to thank you again <laughs> for joining us on WFEV's one-on-one -on -one interview. I was Max Spitza, joined by Lauren Mondaruli. Thank you.